Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. And we're here. we're here. Hey, Frederick Mitchell, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jam. How's it going with you, man? Pretty good, pretty good. This is Jam's Virtual Drupal Camp. I'm with Frederick Mitchell from Phase 2, and Frederick is about to do his session that um, I was not able to see at NYC Camp. 30 super awesome, what was it? Drupal uh, 8? Awesome Drupal 8 API functions, yeah. <laughs> that you should already know. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So, Fred, I am going to hand it over to you and your slides. And um, if anybody wants to ask any questions in the live session, the Q&A app is open on the Google Hangout page, and we will get to those questions by the end. Okay. Sounds great. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, how are we looking? Looks great. Go All for right. it. So as, as Jam, thanks Jam, I appreciate it. And as he said, the, the title of this is called 30 Awesome Drupal 8 API function, Functions You Should Already Know. And um, again, as Jam had said, I, I gave this presentation at NYC Camp um, this past year, and I'll be actually be giving this presentation at DrupalCon Austin as well. So um, if you want to kind of talk to me about it or if you have some critiques, I'm, I'm definitely open to that. So, all right. So assumptions. So the assumptions that I'm making regarding this um, particular presentation is that you actually want to see some code. So I will be showing some code snippets. Um, again, my, my title, as I was saying, is I'm a senior developer, so I'm all about the code. Um, I'm hoping that you've written something custom, you know, and you're familiar with the PHP isms, um, custom modules, etc. I'll just kind of assume that knowledge. I'm also hoping that you like APIs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all about, you know, being able to connect disparate systems via some sort of API. And um, you know, some of the things we'll be talking about will, will revolve around that as well. One of the other things that I'm assuming is that you've, you understand the concept or, or you're open to the idea that Drupal is not only a, a content management system, but it's also a framework, right? It provides this very robust core API library where you can essentially you know, jump into um, as much of the framework as you need to, or you can, you know, build tools for, for, for various um, folks, as we talked about earlier, um, in, in those specific contexts. And then fifth, the other assumption I'm making, and the, the quick link to it, but basically KDS stands for keeping Drupal simple. And it's essentially a philosophy of, again, starting with the API, starting with the core functions, trying to stay within core as much as you possibly can to achieve as much as you need and to, and to basically um, build as needed. So if you want to kind of jump into that. I, I talk about Pattern Lab a bit, if you guys are familiar with Pattern Lab and, and component building versus kind of web page building and how that fits into the Drupal philosophy. You can definitely take a look at that. All right, again, quickly, um, I'm a senior developer at Phase 2 Technology. Uh, my passions, again, are kind of Drupal. Um, the dry and kiss principle, so these are kind of programming principles. Don't repeat yourself and then kind of keep it simple, stupid. Um, I'm really big into strategic communication. Um, one of the things that I do every day is, is, is really kind of understand and, and pull out of, of various colleagues, you know, what the value is, the direction we're going. And then, of course, I also like graphic novels. I mean, who doesn't like graphic novels? Graphic novels are awesome. All right. Before we start, a quick disclaimer. So even though the title in this case was API functions, in D7, API functions meant, right, common procedural functions. In Drupal 8, the term API functions will probably be, or will, will actually mean in this case, common class methods. So, you know, I'll go into this a little bit more, but in most cases, or in some cases, the procedural methods or the procedural functions that we'll talk about are actually just wrappers around um, methods in specific classes. And then we'll kind of talk again about how it exists then, or, you know, and, and then being the D7 way and how it exists now for um, Drupal 8. What a quick, one quick additional disclaimer is that um, this presentation, as you guys know, Drupal 8 is in alpha right now. So the specific 
functions and the specific methods I'm pulling out and the specific classes I'm calling out are based off of, again, a little bit of research I've done inside the change log in terms of the discussions as of March 25th. Um, there's a lot of functions I'm going to go over, as you, as you saw, 30 functions. So um, I'm planning to kind of go back through this again once some of these discussions have kind of progressed, um, but just, just kind of like letting you know. So things will probably change, but that's okay. We're going to roll with the punches and kind of keep it going, and hopefully this presentation will, again, give you that kind of quick, um, you know, quick start that you need to, to think about what you, what you need to do for AAA. All right, so let's jump right into it. So let's talk about strings. Right, so strings are just a manner of printing stuff. And what are our really awesome functions that we use? So um, in Drupal 8, you have a method called check plane. And check plane is essentially um, a static method inside of the string class. In D7, the function was actually check underscore plane. And, and when you use this function, all you, was, all you were essentially doing was um, essentially calling the PHP HTML special characters function. So um, in Drupal 8, it's very similar. You just don't have the check underscore. It's basically check plane, and then you call it, you know, just like you would um, any other kind of static method. The same is true for Drupal underscore placeholder. So if you guys remember, Drupal underscore placeholder is basically um, a wrapper around check plane, and it adds the kind of um, italicized HTML tag, the EM tag, around whatever text that you're doing. So instead of the Drupal underscore placeholder um, procedural function, you're pretty much going to use the placeholder um, method inside, um, static method inside the string class. So what does this look like? Um, so again, you know, the T function, the T function is still there. As, as I'm, I'm sure you guys are probably breathing a sigh of relief, the T function is still there. You can still use that, again, to, um, to translate your text. And then, of course, using your specific placeholder swap, whether it's an add symbol, a modulus symbol, or an exclamation point, you can still use that to, to do your sanitization. And of course, as you guys probably know, the at symbol, again, um, in, uh, invokes the check plane method. If you use the modulus symbol, you're using the placeholder method. And if you use the excla exclamation symbol in your placeholders, then um, you'll be basically printing out as it is. The L function um, is still there. Again, we're still in kind of the strings umbrella. L function is still there. You'd use it just like you would in Drupal 7. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, you can, you know, pass it, pass in your text, you can pass in your URL, you can add specific um, options to that, to the third parameter in the array, and it works just like it, what it does in D7. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so we talked quickly about strings. We just briefly went into this whole, again, idea of, okay, so we went from procedural underscore functions to some quick static methods. That's not too hard. I think strings is, is again, one of those things that didn't really get too much of, of a forklift there. So let's kind of get into rendering. In Drupal 7, um, as you guys probably know, rendering was this concept that basically you give it an array of things and it made it basically printed out what you needed when it eventually went to the theme layer and, and it was shown to the user, right? So rendering is making stuff pretty. So in Drupal 7, as in Drupal 8, you actually are going to use um, your Drupal underscore render function, right? And Drupal underscore render is one of those things that um, I think can probably use a lot more documentation, a lot more blog posts, um, and I probably should do some more about it. But essentially, again, the idea is instead of in your custom module, you know, hard coding HTML in your return functions, you basically can just build an array of the markup you're looking for, whether you're actually defining the markup using the, the hash markup tag inside your array to actually invoking a theme function using the hash theme function and then calling Drupal render, direct, Drupal render directly. I think the one big caveat for D8, though, is that Drupal render is everything. Drupal underscore render is everything. So whereas in D7, you would actually you know, call a theme function manually. So you'd have right, theme, and then the first property or the first parameter inside the theme function was the string of the theme function you're looking for. So if it was a table theme function, so theme underscore table would be theme then the first string function was table, and then you'd pass in the properties. Theme is essentially gone in D8. So right now, underscore theme is like this internal function that they're using until that complete, I, I feel like it's gonna completely be excised from core. So in Drupal 8, Drupal 8 you're gonna wanna basically build everything as a render array. So again, quick code example. So in D7, if we were building um, a, a theme, basically building, outputting a table, Right, we would do 
we would call the theme function directly. Again, we would pass in that string of table, and then we would pass in an array of options specifically to the table theme. So we'd have a header option, we'd have a rows option, and then we'd add some attributes, whether it was a class or an ID for that particular HTML. Then if you want to add a pager, right, we would just um, append um, a pager by calling theme pager. Taking that exact same example in D8, right, in this case, you'll notice that instead of theme, we actually have this new property inside of a Drupal render array, which is um, hash type. And so in hash type, you would say hash type, okay, the type in this case is table, the header is, and so instead of, uh, instead of options, you actually specify for this particular render array, hash header, and then you pass in your header values, your hash rows, you pass in your rows value, the same attributes are still there, and then you call Drupal render. If you want to add a pager to that specific markup, kind of the same thing, you have hash theme, then you pass in the type of theme you want, um, theme function you want, in this case, pager, and then you call your Drupal render, and now you have your pager appended to your markup. So instead of, again, the theme function is completely gone, and you, you basically essentially want to um, use Drupal render all the way. All right, so now we're getting into kind of like the core meaty stuff, right? Nodes, um, and, and nodes, as you guys know, is what source content, that's pretty much kind of the main mechanism that content creators use when they're, when they're uh, working with Drupal as a CMS. So, wait, hold on a second, okay, so, in Drupal 7, we had this concept of entities, and now entity was like the basic building block, right? Because in Drupal 6, nodes was the basic building block, but now in Drupal 7, entity was the basic building block, and everything's entity, users are entities, etc. So why are we talking about nodes, right? Everything is entity now, right? Why, why are we even talking about all the specific node stuff? Because in Drupal 8, it's even more abstracted, and entity is the holy grail, right? And you're right, I, I was getting there, so you know, bear with me for a second. All right, so again, from a conceptual standpoint, right, we have the, we have the D7 uh, procedural function of, of node load multiple. In D8, you're actually gonna wanna use entity load multiple to load a specific set of nodes, right? So what's interesting about entity load multiple is that um, even though as of right now, you could still use node load multiple in D8, all, if you actually look at that function, all it's doing is invoking entity load multiple. So you might as well use that. But even if you use any load multiple, right, we're still in kind of this procedural land of, okay, should I use methods? Which class should I invoke, et cetera? So if I use any load multiple and that's, you know, we can still use that, what is that actually doing? It actually um, wraps around the load multiple method inside of the controller class that's being invoked. So since we're kind of in the nodes umbrella, that specific controller class is the default controller class. In this case, it's the storage controller class, right? So a storage controller is defined for an entity. In this case, the entity type is node. So it's calling the load multiple method inside of the storage controller class, which is the default storage controller for the entity type of node. And then the default storage controller for that specific entity type is actually using the, whatever the default database storage controller class is, right? So if you're kind of out of the box using Drupal, right, you're, and you're messing with nodes, you're going to Essentially, if you use the entity load multiple procedural wrapper, this is how it kind of drills down. So again, a quick kind of code example is, all right, I want to load a whole bunch of nodes quickly. I use any load multiple, I pass in the string of any type that I'm looking for, and then I pass in the IDs specifically, right? And this is pretty cool because it caches it for you, so if you invoke it multiple times, you shouldn't necessarily see a performance hit. All right, so let's talk about entity view multiple, right? That the same kind of principle um, apply. So in D7, when you use node view multiple, you could pass in, write a whole bunch of different nodes. In this case, this is pretty cool because now you can programmatically, right, get, get, get yourself a render array of many nodes. So if you go back to that Drupal underscore render that we talked about earlier, now you can kind of set up your data for Drupal, for Drupal underscore render. So again, node view multiple, as of right now in D8, again, just invoke any view multiple. And any view multiple, as I said before, is just a procedural wrapper that invokes a view multiple method inside the render controller class. And again, this is important to kind of understand because the one kind of main um, advantage and, and kind of awesome hotness with Drupal 8 is the fact that because these things are methods inside of classes and these classes are invoking kind of a default um, um, implementation, right? They're being instantiated in a default way when you need to change those assumptions, right, 
as we all know that you're not supposed to hack core. You can, though, redirect core. You can basically define a new controller, a new storage controller, a new render controller. You can, you can define your own um, controller classes and basically redirect the execution of core without actually having to touch core. And this is actually really powerful because now, whether you have a different database back end to a different rendering front end to any other kind of um, need that you, that any kind of, any other kind of specification that you need for that particular context, this makes it really, really cool. So again, kind of jumping down into this a little bit more, right, the default render controller is using um, the Git view builder um, class for that specific entity. And again, the entity we're talking about is nodes. And then the default view builder controller is likely going to be instantiating the entity view builder class. And again, these things are important to know because if you ever need to, again, redirect the assumptions that are based in these classes that are being um, instantiated or are or, or being called, you know, you knowing how the procedural functions are kind of wrapping around the specific methods is important. So again, the way you do this, you just pass in, you know, your um, your your, your a, whole, a whole bunch of array of, of of entity objects and call entity view multiple. All right, moving on. So we're still in the nodes kind of umbrella of discussion. So node save is gone, right? So in this case, we want to use the kind of default entity um, procedural function. So in this case, you can use entity create. And this again, you can use it to save a node to a database. Um, and as I said before, entity create is again, it's just a procedural function that wraps around um, a method inside of a class. So again, use, going back to that kind of default controller that's going to be used for nodes out of the box and nodes is the kind of the, one of the default entities inside of D8. It's basically, in, it basically invoking the create method, the default again, storage controller for the entity and then the database storage controller is a default a storage controller for that um, specific entity. So if you want to create a node programmatically, you would call entity create, you'd pass in the entity type, and then of course you can pass in another array of options specifically to the entity, which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, you, can, you can do some really cool things there. Um, and then of course, just invoke the save method um, on that entity that's created at that point. Cool? Cool, all right. Let's talk about menus. Um, one of the things I do a lot of times, especially if you've ever had to you know, um, create a menu programmatically or show a menu programmatically or, or manipulate the details inside of a menu depending upon a specific user type or role or a specific context, right? Menus are the thing that allows you to kind of navigate to content, right? It registers paths. All right, so in D7, you use hook underscore menu. In D8, you don't use that anymore, it's gone, right? So in this kind of quick code example, you can see that in my module file, I had a hook underscore menu, and then in hook underscore menu, I defined a path as a key in an array, and then I'd, inside that array, I would define a page callback, which, it, which would invoke a procedural function, which says, okay, if someone goes to abc slash ddf, def, you know, return whatever this function does. In DA, you're actually gonna use what's called um, a YAML file, and in this case, a routing.yaml file. Now, what's really cool about the YAML files and just the whole concept of static configuration files is again, this is this is kind of taking aligning with some best practices that exist um, along again this this full stack spectrum. Um, if you've ever you know done some kind of local development with Vagrant, Vagrant and Puppet, you'll you'll know that um, you know one of the things that that Puppet three is using right now is is a higher YAML file and essentially. What that does is it's just setting configuration parameters for a system to build with. And we're kind of taking that philosophy, or at least, you know, using that philosophy inside of Drupal 8 to do the same thing. Because at the end of the day, when you're defining paths, right, it's essentially just configuration. So instead of having that configuration in some sort of, you know, procedural little bit of a fog, we're going to, again, use that common thread that is used in other um, instances of kind of, again, the full stack a methodology and use the YAML file, in this case, a routing YAML file to define configuration for a route. So if contrasting D7 and D8, right, you set your, you set your path um, in your routing YAML file, and then you basically define, again, where, what, which specific method in your specific controller is going to be invoked 
when that route is seen. And then, of course, you can set different permissions, other requirements, etc. All right, another cool thing that um, that D8 is, is doing is that um, it's putting a lot of things inside of um, the um, a request attribute. And basically, this is taking the place of menu get item. And if you've ever used menu get item to kind of get the details of that specific router item, in this case, you're going to use um, a request attribute. And the request um, attribute is actually can be invoked um, once you invoke the request method inside of the, the, the kind of global Drupal class, it's just a static method. So right now, if you want to get information about a particular request object, um, this is kind of, again, piggybacking off of the new routing system from Symfony. You'd essentially just instantiate um, the Drupal, the kind of global Drupal class statically um, via, via that request method. And then inside that attributes, inside of request, you can grab that, 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 that object. And the same is kind of true for menu get object, right? So menu get object was, as we all kind of know, best practices to figure out what node am I on, or what entity am I on, or what object am I on. Menu get object is gone in, in Drupal 8. So to get the details of what's going on inside of um, a particular object based on the route that you're on, you can essentially jump into again um, the details inside that are returned from the request method from the from the global Drupal object. So in this particular example, um, right, I'm just basically getting the node as part of the attributes inside of what's returned of the request method that's part, again, of that globally called a Drupal object. Now, I will kind of caveat that this is something that's currently being discussed, right? We talked about Drupal 8 being an alpha. So if you want to kind of follow that discussion, as of right now, I just checked it this morning. Um, there's some child issues that have kind of spawned from this, and this is probably going to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, and you can definitely kind of follow that as you need to. All right, so um, continue along again, the, the menu methodology, menu tree page data is still there in Drupal 8 as, as for what I seen. So this is a really cool way to kind of get the information from a menu tree based off of a machine name. So you can still use that, which is awesome. Um, if you want again, kind of set a menu up, if you want to print it out programmatically, you can still use menu tree output. So if you kind of chain the two procedural functions together, you get the data of a, of a specific menu based off a machine name. Then you pass in that tree and the level of tree that you want into menu tree output. And now you essentially have a render array of that specific menu. And that's how it exists in D7. And how it, it, how, it's how it's going to exist in D8 as of right now. And then you can pass it into Drupal Render um, just like anything else. So that's pretty cool. All right, so let's kind of jump into taxonomy, right? Taxonomy is, is how you kind of organize your data a bit. Taxonomy is its own entity, right? You can categorize content, you can categorize data, you can basically attach some sort of organizational meta to the entity that you're looking for via some sort of field. So programmatically in D7, there was this really, really cool, long name called taxonomy, vocabulary, machine name, load. Right. And what that basically did was you could take the machine name of a piece of taxonomy, throw it into that function, and it would give you that vocabulary object back. In D8, again, we want to streamline this, right? Instead of having a kind of custom call out for taxonomy, since taxonomy is an entity, and we've already talked about, you know, entity create, entity load, entity load multiple for nodes, why wouldn't we use the same type of functions for taxonomy? And we would. So the difference is, is that in, instead of passing the entity type of node in terms of this first parameter, the this, this string of node, you pass in taxonomy underscore vocabulary. So if you want to load a, vo a vocabulary programmatically, you'd call the same kind of entity load method, right? And we kind of talked about what entity load does and what it wraps around. You can, again, kind of get that, that vocabulary object as you need it. Taxonomy get tree is still there. So if you still want to um, kind of programmatically create um, a hierarchical structure of taxonomy terms. You can still use taxonomy get tree once you have your vocabulary object loaded. And again, this, this quick example kind of goes through all the terms and kind of builds an options array if you need to do that. So that's still there, which is great. Cool. All right. So we talked about strings. We talked about menus. We talked about nodes and content. We talked about taxonomy. Right, let's talk about right the, the other really, really, really important part, which kind of I think, you know, where the rubber meets the road in terms of what Drupal is really known for, 
which is making things fieldable, right? Fields are a way to not only organize content, right? You can associate taxonomy to it, but, but it now becomes this pivot point of how the data is architected, right? When you create a field on something, whether it's a user, taxonomy, node, or any kind of entity, right? You now are not only giving the user this power to, you know, um, organize their content as it relates to that specific entity, but you're also doing some data architecture behind the scenes of the relationships between, you know, the various tables that are created at this point. In D7, there is a, a really cool kind of procedural function called field info field. In D8, um, we basically have a get field method. And the get field method, again, is, is, is kind of buried inside of that kind of global Drupal class that you can call. Um, and inside this, the field info method, again, is, is, is a static method you can invoke from the, the Drupal, um, the Drupal, as I said, the Drupal global namespace. Um, and, there's, and there's a field class inside of there. So if you want to get the specific information of a specific field, you would invoke the get field method after getting the field info, right? And you would basically get all the details of that specific field. So if you didn't want to manipulate that field later, delete it, update it, et cetera, you now have kind of the, all the pieces you need for that specific um, field. The one thing I would note is that um, <clears throat> this specific method does eventually invoke entity load. So if we go back to what we talked about before of, okay, kind of streamlining all of the pieces that are invoked, regardless of the entity type that you're using, in this case, fields have essentially two entity types that are attached to them, either the field configuration or the instance configuration of that field. Speak of the devil, here we go. So if you want to get the information about a specific instance, right? So again, kind of quickly recapping, the information about a field is kind of the basic information of how a field is going to be structured, right? Is it a textless type of field? What is the configuration of that field? Because it can be reused in other places. The instance of a field is where that field is actually being used, right? So if you have a list text field that is used at a node and used at a user, the configuration is the fact that it's a text list. The instance is, okay, what is it? How is it being used on the node part? Then you have a separate instance of how it's being used on the user part. So if you want to get information about a specific instance, you first have to get the field info. And again, you can kind of invoke that from, again, the global Drupal namespace um, of, the, of the Drupal object. And then you can ca then call um, the get instance method once you kind of get that field info um, object and pass in your entity type your bundle type, and then of course your, your, your field name um, specifically, which is really cool. Um, and again, kind of, again, going back to this kind of common theme as you guys are probably noticing that this specific method is just a wrapper around any load multiple, which again kind of goes back down into that whole, okay, it wraps around you know, the controller, it wraps around the, the, the storage controller, which wraps around the database controller. In this case, again, the entity type for, um, instances is the instance configuration. So it's field underscore instance underscore config as an entity type for, for fields. So if you want to create a field, right? Again, why would we have a custom function just for creating fields? Um, we can reuse this entity layer that we already have and we can invoke, right, the entity create method, which again, if you think back to what I was just talking about in terms of the entity types that kind of power fields, right? We have the field configuration, which again, is kind of the base portion, then you have the, the instant configuration. So if you want to create a field, you can simply just, again, call entity create, which again, is going to be a wrapper around, um, you know, a specific um, method inside the storage controller. And then you're just basically going to load the entity type of field underscore config along with the values you would like to create um, programmatically of a field. So in this case, instead of, whereas we use the node, we had a default um, storage controller for field configuration, there's a default field configuration storage controller, which again kind of jumps into the default database storage controller and all the other methods that are going to be invoked when you're creating a field that you want to use when you're manipulating a field or setting the various properties. I definitely would encourage you to kind of look inside of the field config class that's kind of again in this, this, this Drupal global namespace. It's, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. So again, Quick kind of code example. So in D7, 
if you guys are familiar with features, right, if you ever exported a feature and exported a field, you'd get this really giant big array of things. It would give you all the details of a specific field, right? So whether it was active, what was the cardinality, um, what type it was, what were the filters that were allowed in that specific type, um, whether it was translatable, et cetera. And then you would pass all this giant array into the field create field method, or field create field function, I should say. In DA, you can make that a lot simpler, right? You can basically just create a field configuration entity using the entity create method or entity create function, pass in your array of details that you need, and then just invoke the save method. That's so much cleaner. And that's really cool because if you start, again, thinking about, okay, what can I do programmatically just with core in terms of creating fields, in terms of updating specific field types, right? Depending upon your user context, if you have a user that, you know, um, is, 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 is not going to be jumping into all of the different buttons inside of, of Drupal, right? Because as we know, Drupal has a ton of configuration options. And they just want this kind of a la carte white club kind of, okay, I want to submit a ticket or I want to, I want to create a request and I want these things to just appear before me, right? Being able to do that programmatically and set that in update hooks kind of fits into the mechanism of a multi-team or a multi-developer team that you can see the progress of how things have changed, right? You can create fields programmatically. You can update fields programmatically. You can delete things. You can move things around. You can change the weight of things that they appear for your various um, user experiences when they're creating content. Being able to do this simply programmatically in D8 is gonna be really awesome. The same is true for creating instances, right? Programmatically, same kind of thing. So we'll kind of jump through this a little bit quickly. But in this case, again, the, the entity type is filled to instance config. And it's the same kind of deal. You use entity create to create your field instance. And in this case, it's invoking, um, or it's using the field instance or instantiating, I should say, sorry, the field instance config storage controller. And again, if you want to kind of see all the other methods that are inside the field instance config class, I definitely encourage you to take a look at that because you can do all these cool things, whether it's creating a field to updating a field to changing specific parts of the instance for that specific field. There are methods that will help you do that versus having to know the giant array. So again, if we look at that kind of giant array, right, you kind of have to know what bundle is there already, what the entity type, the field name, et cetera, and then you pass it in the field create instance in D7. In D8, it's a lot simpler, it's a lot smoother, it's a lot, you know, a lot more easier to kind of understand. And especially when you're thinking about a project that's gonna evolve over a long period of time where multiple developers are gonna jump in and jump out, having these kind of palatable ways to create um, fields is gonna definitely, you know, save, save some time in understanding, you know, what happened, what do I need to change? Um, the other cool bonus thing, and I haven't made a D8 version of this yet, is that you could probably create a, your own method or set of classes or even function to kind of do this automatically. So if you want to pass in, you know, um, a specific field definition and kind of do it on the fly, you could use something like this. Um, so we need to kind of build that for D8 at some point once that once D8 gets into beta and kind of locks down. All right. So continuing along the lines of fields, this is probably the last slide regarding fields is actually updating fields, right? So in D7, you had separate procedural functions for updating fields depending upon what you're trying to do. Whether you're trying to update the, 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 the field base or whether you're trying to update the instance, you would have to know to call field update field or field update instance. In Drupal 8, you're just calling the save method, right? You load the entity, you manipulate it as you need to, and then you save it. That's it. So you can see in this example, right, I want to change the cardinality of a specific field from maybe one to two. I load the field using, again, those, those field info, the entity load um, functions that I showed you earlier. I change the, the, the property that I need to inside the field object. I invoke save. I want to delete the field. I load the field, whether it's the configuration of the instance, and then I call the delete method. Same kind of methodology. You don't have to go through this whole kind of piece of, you know, some of the hoops that you need to jump through in order to kind of load the entire field configuration as you did in, in Drupal 7, which I think, again, streamlining is good. Learning efficiency is good. The fact that you can learn these things a lot faster, I think, is good for everyone. All right, so let's talk about alters, right? Um, alters are this thing, as you guys know, that basically allows you to change the assumptions inside Drupal. Right, Drupal is, is, is using, um, especially Drupal 7 is using this kind of aspect-oriented 
you know, philosophy where instead of an object-oriented philosophy where you basically inherit certain child classes, you basically have this horizontal kind of invocation method of, okay, I'm going to do some things, and now I'm going to kind of call out horizontally, does anyone want to change these assumptions before I continue my execution? In Drupal 7, you had Drupal underscore alter. That's gone in Drupal 8. In this case, you just want to call an alter method, and the alter method is part of as a static method inside of the module handler class. And the module handler class, again, is, is, is um, our module handler, um, yeah, module handler class can be instantiated from the Drupal global object. So you can essentially call it as you see, as you see here. So if you want to set up some data and actually allow it to be altered later down, later down the pipe, you can basically just pass in um, your data to your alter method. Hook form alter is still there. So if you do want to kind of programmatically change the assumptions of a particular form, you can still do that. So that's pretty cool. Hook form form ID alter, as you all kind of know, is probably a better practice. Instead of having a generalized form alter, you probably want to specifically target that form using the form ID. That is still there. I think the one cool thing, though, is that, um, you know, in Drupal 8, the way to get the form ID is actually a little bit easier. All right, so in Drupal 7, the way that I typically do it, and this, you know, I haven't told any, I, no one's told me any different way to, to do it, is that if I want to alter a form, I first had to go to the form as it's rendered in the web. So I have to find that form somewhere. Then I basically right click inside that form, inspect the DOM element in Firefox or Chrome. Then on the form element inside of HTML, right, there's an ID of that form. And that's how I know what the form ID was. So I knew which form ID to use in my alter. When well, Drupal 8, there's a get form ID method. And that actually defines the ID. So now when you want to alter a form, you can actually just look at what's returned and get form ID and quickly be, be able to alter that form. So if we have a quick example of kind of building a form inside of Drupal 8, right, you invoke the namespace, the form namespace, you define your own namespace for the specific form. You extend a form base uh, parent class, and then you basically call a get form ID method. And this method, again, will return basically a string of the form ID of the form you're trying to build, which now allows anyone who wants to alter your form, all they, they have to, they can do that right there inside of the class itself, which I think is really cool. And then of course you would do your form ID alters just like you would anywhere else. And if you want to kind of really learn more about the current structure of the form API, I definitely encourage you to take a look um, at that discussion at that point regarding um, the form API. All right, hooks. Again, another kind of part of aspect-oriented um, kind of programming, engaging other processes, right? Instead of module invoke underscore all, you have the invoke all um, static method, which again can be called from the global Drupal namespace, and you just use invoke all just like you would module invoke all, pass in your hook, et cetera. Um, module underscore implement. So if you want to check to see if a module actually implements a specific hook um, in Drupal 8, it's get implementations as part of the module handler class. So it's a static method inside the module handler class and you can um, just pass that in um, like you would anything else. URLs, right? Okay, so we talked about paths, we talked about again kind of this horizontal inv invocation with hooks and alters now we want to talk about okay if something is passed in via the url right kind of thinking along the the rest philosophy or, or even just kind of the way you would pass data back and forth um at the um at the request object you know there are some helper functions there to, to kind of grab that information for you in d7 it was drupal get query parameters to process the url query in drupal 8 again there's these helper methods um, there's a filter query parameters method that's in part of the URL helper class to static method, and you can just do it that way. So in this case, right, you would query, again, going back to that request object, you would query all the information that's inside the request object, and then based on what was passed back of that URL, you could then filter those query parameters, and then you'll get a nice, really cool array of all the query parameters kind of broken out, which really helps, especially, again, if you're passing things back and forth between either different page calls or you know, you want to show things based on what exists in a particular URL. A really cool example that I use all the time is, okay, you know, if um, one role is supposed to see something versus another role versus some other particular role or some other context, 
you know, instead of building separate pages or separate callbacks for each one of those, you can build one callback and then basically pass in various UR parameters to show and hide different things as you need. Oops. Paths. All right. Where am I? What, where, where am I inside of kind of, you know, when I'm doing things programmatically? Right. Drupal git path is still there. Right. So if you want to load some custom JS or CSS file, whatever, you can still do that. Whether it's a theme file or module file, you can still do that inside of Drupal 8, which is great. I'm going to load the specific user. Global user is gone. In Drupal 8, you want to invoke the current user method, a static method inside of, again, the global Drupal namespace. So global user is gone, so you don't want to use that anymore. And if you want to see more information of how to do that, definitely check out that. It's a pretty simple example um, of how to kind of do it. Um, so again, if I want to load the current account, I just call current user static method on the Drupal object. I check it, and I do what I need to do. The one caveat there you'll notice is that account is not an actual user object, but a user session object, and it extends, eventually extends the account interface class. Want to load and include file. Module load include is gone. Instead, you want to lose the load include method from the module handler class. And again, that's part of the Drupal, kind of global Drupal namespace. Um, really, really straightforward. Querying. All right, so hopefully all of you know that when you query entities inside of Drupal, this is especially true for Drupal 7, you shouldn't be doing, right, direct queries to the tables and doing all those joins. You should be using, right, entity field query. Entity field query has now been simplified um, into entity query. Again, and this is a method that's part of the, the kind of global Drupal namespace. Um, and this is really cool to kind of search a single entity. So instead of entity field query like you would in D7, where you would create a new entity field query object and then basically pass in a whole bunch of different prop, or different conditions based on um, methods that would take in different, different properties, right? So if you wanted a, an article node that was published, this is how you do it in D7. Um, and if you want to know more information, if, you if you're not using any field query, you can definitely check out my, my presentation that I did of top 10 reasons of why to use any field query. If you're not already doing so, I highly, 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 highly recommend you look at that if you don't. But in D8, very similar, but instead of having specific methods, um, you know, for entity condition or properties, you're just basically setting conditions. So you would invoke or instantiate an, an entity query via um, the entity query um, method pass in the entity type you're looking for, pass in your different conditions, just like anything else, and then you have your query. Very similar, you know, but a little bit different. And again, we're just trying to kind of streamline a lot of different things, right? We talked about how instead of having specific functions for taxonomy and menus and users and nodes and stuff, we're gonna basically everything is entityized. So the same is gonna be true for the query. We wanna just use entity query instead of entity field query. Wow, was that 30? Kind of didn't feel like it, right? I kind of ran through these pretty quickly. So let's, what about functions that are completely removed? Did we kind of talk about things that just don't have a replacement? Let's talk about those. So your favorites. <laughs> Drupal add JS, Drupal add CSS, and Drupal add library are all gone. There is no replacement function. Instead, what you're gonna to wanna to use is the attached property. And you can do this in Drupal 7. You probably should be doing this already in Drupal 7. When you're defining a block or defining a form, instead of you know, using Drupal add JS, you're gonna to wanna to use the attached property. And if you wanna kind of follow the discussion, the decision why, you can check out that specific node um, on Drupal.org. But a quick example, and this is actually taken from core. So when you want to add a particular library to a form, right, instead of doing Drupal add JS, Drupal add CSS, right, you would basically pass in this attached property and then define the various parts. So you'd have a library, and then you define the library here. You'd have, you know, your JavaScript, and then you define the specific properties of how you want to load that JavaScript, whether it's a setting, what the data is, and then actually render the specific data itself, etc. So again, you can do this in Drupal 7. I highly encourage you guys to go ahead and do that in Drupal 7 and kind of get away from Drupal add CSS, Drupal add JS, etc., and basically load things using an attached key in your forms, in your blocks, in your things as you need it. Um, so that, you know, you use it, you basically are loading 
those particular elements in the context that they're needed instead of you know every single time. All right, so let's kind of jump through these real quick, right? So we did strings. So those were kind of the first four. Then we talked about Drupal render, right? Drupal load multiple, node view multiple kind of went away. We're kind of streamlining those with entity load and any view multiple, respectively. Right, we talked about how node underscore save is gone, hook underscore menu is gone, right? We're streamlining that into entity create. The routing files, the configuration files um, using YAML. Menu get item is gone, or using request attributes. We still have some stuff that we can use, right, in, um, that was in D D7 that we can use in D8, the menu tree stuff, the taxonomy get tree stuff, but a lot of the field specific procedural functions, taxonomy specific spe uh, procedural functions are gone in favor of kind of streamline entity create functions, right? And the same is true for updating specific instances. We're going to use save methods instead. Um, we talked about kind of the helper classes, the module handler classes, the alter methods, et cetera, for Git implementations, invoke all, et cetera. The hook form alters are still there, but um, instead of, you know, entity query, instead of entity field query, you now we're just kind of doing a, a basic entity, you know, regular entity query instead of entity field query. So technically, the ones that I showed you weren't completely 30, but if you consider the fact that I actually told you that three were removed, that's actually more. So I did kind of fulfill my promise and say that, you know, yeah, we did go through 30. And yeah, those are all pretty awesome. I'm really excited for Drupal 8, so. What's next? What should you be doing next? So I would say definitely contribute to the examples module. I know there's, there's some help there needed. Right, that was one of the really cool things for me learning Drupal 7 a few years ago, kind of understanding, okay, how do we do certain things, forms, menus, Ajax examples. Definitely contribute there or look at there, you know, if, if you're looking for something else to kind of look at. Read the docs, um, you know, specifically to the API for Drupal 8, right? Um, and then the other thing that I wanna show you, and I probably need to refresh this, is check out the scaffolding module. So. Um, my, my good friend Jesus is, is really kind of working on um, a scaffolding uh, module for Drupal, and this is um, borrowing from Symfony. So what this basically does is that you can essentially invoke um, a set of functions from the from, from you know programmatically, which will build out the folder that you need when you're building a particular um, module from start. So it's almost like a module starter. So whether you're you know, building a custom module that's gonna have menu functions, or whether you wanna include certain things, a custom form, it will know and basically set up your folders and set up your files accordingly. This is a really cool way to kind of learn all the different pieces that are involved into what goes into building a Drupal 8 module. So let's get into the questions. And again, if you wanna see these slides, that's the URL for those slides. If you want to contribute or fork these slides, um, they are on GitHub. They're open for everyone. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Fred. That was great. Um, nice tie-in. Jesus just demonstrated the D8 module scaffolding module on my Drupal camp this week. So, Excellent. So there you go. He gave a really, really hardcore, very interesting demo of how that goes. So. Um, very good tip, indeed. What about having a library JS getting loaded for all of the pages instead of some specific form? Right, so you would do that just like you would any other piece. Um, you would define that library or that you know, JS um, in, in, in like you would a theme function. So if you, if, if for instance, if you had a, a CSS file or JS file that need to load in every page request, you define it in the in the info of that theme, but if you if you're having a if you need to load a library specifically to a context of a block being rendered or a form being rendered, you would use the attached property. Okay, cool. Now, um, Doug Van has one more question that I would like to start out addressing, and then um, feel free to jump in if you have anything to say sure. about this. Uh, my biggest question is this. Do we have any indication that this large volume of changes is drawing interest from new developers? We're targeting a very specific demographic with these changes. Do we know we're attracting that demographic? So, Doug, I want to break this down into a couple, at least a couple of points. Um, the changes 
way down deep inside the code, like how Drupal is built under the hood on the one hand, and um, the changes that they make to the visible, usable, clickable UI on the other hand, because um, I think there are two um, separate issues. And I think that Drupal has been changed significantly in Drupal 8 for different reasons for different audiences. Um, so I don't think that we're just targeting one single demographic with everything that's gone into Drupal 8, um, especially everything that's, uh, for example, flown out of the Spark project um, and every, um, and uh, so, you know, content authors, editors, workflows, um, their day-to-day -day job should be easier to make easy because the user interface is so much better because WYSIWYGs in core, because the, the demands that they have for their jobs have been addressed. So I think that we've made a much better experience, much easier to make for that um, target group and for anyone administering a Drupal site the fact that we've done things like build the entire admin in interface out of views now gives us a completely customizable, configurable backend, um, which is an incredible win because as long as you know how to configure a view, you can make your own backend for Drupal um, and you can customize it. And that's something that used to be a, a really, really special hell delivering projects and giving a backend that was actually really suited to whatever the purpose of that site was. And now I think we can do custom backends like we've never done before, and I, I find that amazing. Um, about the changes under the hood, and I know that was, I believe that was your specific question. Um, I've been talking with um, people like Sensio Labs UK and their parent company, Invika, um, both publicly and in, in, in private. I met a ton of symphony people in person in the last few months and i've been talking with um symphony shops and mixed skill shops and i've been told all sorts of very encouraging things i was told by a guy whose business is doing integrations with um complex legacy systems and e-commerce and uh he has always done um i'm trying to think uh so, and he's been sort of a pure PHP shop. And he told me very, very specifically that now that Drupal 8 uh, includes the Symfony components and the, and the, the compatibilities and the, the object orientation that it does, he is thrilled to never have to touch Typo 3 again. Now, that's just what he told me. Um, and <laughs> he, will, he will, as soon as Drupal 8 is out, that is his CMS of choice. And Drupal's never been that before. Um, I've also had people from the Symphony community tell me that um, Drupal is going to be their choice for, for managing content and for doing things that Drupal is already good at, uh, dealing with access, the user roles, permissions, that sort of stuff. Um, so they've got this very powerful CMS now that they can just turn to and they can put it next to or integrated uh, ar around their targeted, slender, specific application that they're still going to build with Symfony, but the fact that they can look into Drupal and understand it now gives them incredible confidence to do integration projects now and to do special things with a sort of a with a with a much bigger toolbox than they've had before. Uh, time will tell. Um, and there, there, there are people who feel that starting from zero and building everything up is more attractive to them than, you know, starting with the Drupal house and taking out the pieces until you have what you want. But I've had a lot of conversations that tell me that we are going to indeed have a, a, a much broader user base over time, developer base, and so on. Fred? Oh, sorry. You, know, I, you said everything that needed to be said. I, I agree. I mean, okay. I think the best <laughs> answer was the fact, you know, like, hey, Zeus is, you know, a Symphony developer. He's coming over and he's building you know, a scaffolding thing. I mean, even, I mean, that simple example, I think, you know, the answer to your question, Doug, is yes. I think we're tracking a demographic for sure. So. Oh, that's true. Jesus told me that actually um, he messed around with Drupal a few, few years ago, but he was a, a pure symphony guy uh, until, until the Drupal 8 cycle got rolling. And then he got excited and he's been doing all sorts of amazing stuff now um, on yeah. Drupal 8. That's true. That's a, great, that's a great case in point. So Frederick, thank you so, so, so much for taking the time to come on and do this today.
Great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right. Take care, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.